Thank you all for being here. I'm so grateful that you are here to talk about this difficult topic of suicidality. It's not something you wake up and go, yay, let's go talk about suicide, but it is so important and I'm grateful for you to be here. Um, my son and I thought about doing this uh, a couple of months ago. My son is 19. He's adopted, addicted, uh, or has struggled with addiction and has mental health issues and has had suicidality pretty much since elementary school, but particularly bad the last couple of years. And um, so we had this idea to create this um, workshop after another a young person at our church had an attempt. And I could tell that no one knew what to say. They're like, oh, can I even say that word? I don't know. It's so hard. And so we thought, yeah. The most important thing is just to be able to talk about this stuff. So thank you for coming here and being willing to talk about this. Here is a few little logistics and then we'll get going. I want you to consider self-care during this webinar. Suicide can be very triggering and very emotional. So please take care of yourself. If you get overwhelmed, you're welcome to walk away, um, reach out to um, myself on private uh, chat or Frank, who I will introduce in a second. You can reach out to either of us in private chat. 988 is always available. If there's a mental health crisis or suicidality, I wanna make sure everyone knows about the number at 988. Uh, wanna let you know, we are just sharing our personal stories and perspectives. Uh, Frank, I and Joey are not therapists or professional healthcare providers, and we are just encouraging you all to get professional help whenever needed. Therapy for everyone. And here's how it's gonna go today. First, I'm gonna show you a video from my son, Joey. Then I'm gonna share just a tiny bit about myself, about my own journey with suicidality. Then I'm going to introduce Frank, our guest expert, who is going to share a very short version of his story. And we will have uh, ways for you to find out more about his story later. And then the rest of the time will be for Q and A. So please think of your questions that you want answered about suicidality we really want to help. So right now I'm going to see, I'm going to share a video from my son. When we made this event, he, we hoped he would be here with us live, but happily he's at rehab. So uh, instead we made a video last Sunday and I'm so proud of him. Uh, it's about seven minutes and here's my son, Joey. Hey everyone, my name is Joey Nacal. And uh, it's unfortunate that I couldn't be here with you guys because I'm actually at rehab. Rehab is going well. I'm 30 something days sober and I'm happy to be here. Doing well and here to tell you my story. Okay, my story with suicide actually starts when I was in elementary school. Uh, bullying was a big part of my life. Uh, one kid, said um i'm turning japanese with his eyes you know like this that really affected me later on in life but at that point i didn't really know what happened what was going on M uh, middle school i just got teased for being different because i was in a white dominated school in uh, huntington beach um then in high school is when it kind of all went down I, I hit my first vape pen um it got me to a place that felt like comfortable but then I started to take LSD and then that got me to another realm and I was after that first trip I was seeking for the other realm and that's what caused me to seek death or drugs and I chose death because it would be permanent and it I attempted by trying to hang myself but then I got to a point where it hurt I, I wasn't like hanging off like a like a ceiling or anything I, I was just off my own weight trying to like choke myself to death um but i couldn't do it the pain was too much so i stopped but it all was from bullying and drug abuse that caused me to do that life with suicidal ideation is tough um it's a constant battle with your own self saying do you want to live today or do you not want to live today because at any moment you can do anything if you're not in a safe place uh, since I'm in a safe place it's really actually difficult to 
do anything, but if you're out there just in your home and you're having suicidal ideation, talk to someone. Definitely, that's a big key in what, how I am staying alive is talking to people, talking about how I feel. Even if it's a good day, just talk about how you feel. It's important to let those emotions out. And the suicidal ideation may still be there, but it will be diminished and depressed by the talking and maybe even journaling and going to therapy. Those are good things you can do. Um, even if you have to take meds, that's what you can do. Why don't you tell people about the SI scale? What is that? The SI scale is suicidal ideation and it goes from one to 10. And 10 is like, I need to go to the hospital right now or I'm about to kill myself right now. One is I have some little, I have a little bit of thought, but I'm not gonna do anything. I can go on with my day. So yeah, and then five is like, I need support at the deepest point. Like, I just need to talk to someone. I need help, but I don't need to go to the hospital right now. There's a cry for help almost. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And and I often ask you, what's your SI? Mm -hmm. And how does that feel for you? How does that land when I say, what's your SI right now? Sometimes it may trigger me, but sometimes it actually helps me to get out and say, okay, yes, I need to tell someone that I'm X like or seven or eight. That's when you really do need to be honest with people about how you feel because if it goes any longer, you could be at a 10 and you can't be really helped. You can be helped, but it's harder to help someone at a 10. It's easier to help someone at a six or seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, what's your like regular everyday number? Are you sometimes zero or is it sometimes low numbers like what's your regular everyday baseline today uh, my regular baseline is about a two or three and it's been really good lately um uh, my mom my meds um i've been talking i've had therapy it's really good i'm in a treatment program it's it's good it's under control right now but i know it won't always be like that so i know to talk to people and mm -hmm. do the thing yeah and uh, besides when you tried to hang yourself from psychedelics, have there been other attempts? Yes, been? there's been many attempts. Um, I know that's, I said that so casually, but <laughs> um, a, a, a few of them have been through uh, hanging and uh, some and another was overdosing and overdosing is the other one, uh, cutting. I don't know, I never really cut to kill myself, but uh, I cut to harm myself because I didn't like who I was, or I just needed to feel the pain, mm -hmm. so yeah. And you tried to drown yourself once? Oh yeah, I tried to drown myself at one point. That was my last attempt, actually. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you tried to drink a whole bottle, or you did drink a whole oh, bottle drink, of vodka? Oh, I drank a whole bottle of vodka. See, my brain is not really 100% <laughs> there because of those things I did, so. Mom remembers them all. Mom but, remembers them. Yeah, you hoped to not wake up. Yeah, I just, it was an attempt at suicide. It wasn't successful. We're happy it was not Yes, successful. it was. I'm so very... Do you have any suggestion regarding pills? Because a lot of people have pills at their house. And... Yeah, um, all pills. Just put away if you have children that are... Or adults even that are suicidal. Um, or drug addicts. Just put away the, the, the pills because it's a risk. Because any pill can really kill someone. Like Even Advil or Advil anything, probably, yeah. anything you take a whole bottle of will possibly kill you. So just lock them all away somewhere. Yeah, and ropes and knives if they're in a suicidal ideation like thing. Yeah, if they're actively uh, kind of considering it, yeah, you just they're actively take away all the knives and ropes and you know, gosh, you can't even have shoelaces or drawstrings in, when you go into psych. Like, in fifty-one fifties, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a parent, like you should definitely reach out to your child or um, to the person in need. Go talk to them and say, are you okay? Do you need someone to talk to? Um, because that could just, that one little conversation could change their mind and it could save their lives. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Definitely just be there as support. That's what I can say. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. If you have any questions, you can ask my mom anything, um, especially about suicide, obviously. It, she's there to help and support you. And I do give consent to uh, her to sit, tell you guys about my story, any, any more part of my story. So yeah, just don't worry about that. <laughs> you. Yeah, and thank you guys. Um, hope you guys look the best and I'm sorry I couldn't be here. Whew. Okay. My love, my sweet love, he's in there. Um, especially those of you that know my son. <laughs> I wonder what that, how that landed for you guys. So I'm really grateful he was able to make that video. Sorry, there were some cuts in there. It, I guess the house where he's at is in the middle of a flight path because there were like many like biplanes, little jets and stuff. <laughs> it was all chopped up. But uh, I hope that that helped you understand my heart and why I'm doing this work that I'm doing. Uh, just a tiny bit about my own self and I can share in the Q&A or after, you know, ongoing um, about raising a child with chronic suicidality. It is, has forced me to do my own personal growth work. So I'm not just a nervous wreck every moment of the day and terrified. And so I've developed mindfulness and a presence because of all of these challenges that I never have had before. Um, and all my life, I've also suffered from depression as long as I can remember. And there have been many times in my life, I don't know if any of you can relate, where if a truck would have just taken me off the road and done me in, that would have been just fine. I, I would never have, I've never been to the place where I would have picked something up to kill myself, but if something happened to kill me, that was actually totally good. Or if I didn't wake up the next morning, that would have been fine with me. So I think that's called passive suicidality. That's what I call it. It's no fun. It's really not a good place to be. And when I get that place, I uh, tend to nowadays pull back and say, oh, I'm calling in sick. I need a mental health day, whatever. So there's a wide range of what suicidality can look like, but all of it is really painful. It's just a way for pain to kind of present itself, right? I am very um, grateful to Frank King, who is here with us today. He is the mental health comedian. He's been on our podcast, but that is uh, small beans compared to all the TED Talks he's been on. And he goes and speaks around the world. And he talks about his own mental health um, crises and living with mental health issues and su uh, chronic suicidality. So super grateful for Frank. He's donating his time for this today. Uh, I will drop in some links so you can go uh, find his website and his TED Talks if you want to hear more, because he's going to have to do a really quick one so we can get to Q&A. So welcome, Frank. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Uh, she said I donated my time. I donated five minutes. Not a huge donation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> although I'll be with you guys. An hour. An hour. An hour. I am the mental health comedian. That may sound strange. Uh, it's the elephant in the room when I speak. And I open up by saying, I know what you're thinking. Comedian talking about depression, thoughts of suicide. How does that work? I think a comedian's a good choice. Here's why. The world's first comedians were court jesters. Their job, speak truth to power on behalf of the powerless with humor. I believe I speak truth to the power of mental illness on behalf of those often powerless in its grip with humor. I believe where there's humor, there's hope. Where there's laughter, there's life that nobody really dies laughing. And depression and suicide run in my family. It's called generational depression and suicide. My grandmother died by suicide. My mother found her. Nine years later, my great aunt died by suicide. My mother and I found her. I was four years old. I screamed for days. And if you're that close to an actual suicide, and if you hear the story, and it's in my first TEDx talk, a matter of laugh or death, if you're that close to an actual suicide, chances are later in your life, you will seriously consider taking your life. And that's what happened in April of 2010. At the height of the last recession, my wife and I had lost everything we'd worked for in 25 years of our marriage in a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And that's when I learned what the barrel of my gun tasted like. Uh, spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. Uh, that usually gets a nervous laugh from the audience. They're wondering, should we be laughing at this? And I followed up with this. A friend of mine saw me speak recently, came up afterwards. Hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I said, hey, man, could you try to sound slightly less disappointed? 
that's where the humor is in a topic this dark. It's not jokes. There's nothing to joke about depression, thoughts of suicide, and mental illness. However, funny personal anecdotes, you know, stories that are not made up. There are things that actually happened to me. And I usually include those in my TEDx talks, um, you know, to, they call it comic relief for a reason. Uh, I live with two mental illnesses. One is called chronic suicidal ideology. I'm sorry. One is called major depressive disorder, relatively common, uh, not situational for the most part. I've been most depressed some of the best times in my life. I talk about uh, just a wheel with a flat spot. Every now and then it comes up and I, I my cycle's three days up and down. Um, some people three weeks. Uh, it just depends on who you are. I used to say I fight depression. I don't say that anymore. I don't fight the depression because I'm not going to win. I can lose and kill myself, tie and stay alive, but I'm not going to win. And it takes a lot to, t to try and fight uh, depression. So I just I get on my surfboard, uh, my crazy surfboard, catch the wave of depression and just ride it, um, blend with the energy for the three days, knowing that it's just a visitor. It'll be leaving after 72 hours. Uh, technique that helps keep me alive. Um, my suicidality actually is a lifesaver, uh, ironically. Um, chronic suicidal ideation means that for people like me, my tribe, the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small, almost a coping mechanism. And uh, when I say small problems, my car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts unbidden. One, get it fixed. Two, buy a new and three, I could just kill myself. That's chronic suicidal ideation. However, ironically, because I have chronic suicidal ideation and I made a decision a long time ago that I am perfectly capable of killing myself, I believe suicide is not so much about wanting to kill yourself, about it, about ending the pain. And so I can stand a great deal more pain knowing that I am in control. I can take my life at any time I choose. So ironically, uh, my chronic suicidal ideation helps keep me alive. If it were for my chronic suicidal ideation, I probably killed myself a long time ago, mm -hmm. as ironic as that sounds. I and, and telling that story on stage about chronic suicidal ideation, because it's not in the DSM-5. Uh, I have clinicians stare at me when I say chronic suicidal ideation. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. However, every time I've spoken since 2014, there's been at least one person in the audience. There may be somebody on this call in the audience who has chronic suicidal ideation, don't know it has a name, think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. I did a college, a young woman came up afterwards. Thanks for your keynote. I said, you're welcome. She goes, but God tell you, it made me weep. How did it make you weep? She goes, you know your story about the car, get it fixed, buy a new one, killing yourself? Yeah. She goes, I've been having those thoughts all my life. I didn't know that had a name. I thought I was just some kind of freak and I was completely alone. And when I heard you say that out loud, I realized for the first time in my life that I'm not alone and I wept. What I get paid to do as a suicide prevention speaker is simply, and my clients tell me this, start the conversation. Start the conversation on suicide, break the silence, and you break the stigma. You can make a difference. You can save a life and you can do it by doing something as simple as what we're doing right here, and that is starting a conversation. Yep. Whoa, five minutes, four seconds, mic drop. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. That was awesome. Thank you so much for doing that so quickly. I know you have so much to your story. So um, go check out the links that I just uh, dropped. Uh, go find out more about Frank and he will be here to answer your questions. And I'm here as well. So just let us know who you want to ask a question of. And I think why don't we uh, use the reaction button and raise your hand. And you're again, you're will you're open to ask on video just audio or on chat. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have any questions. All right, Mimi, thank you. Go ahead. Make sure and unmute yourself. There you go. Um, I'm um, Mimi James and, um, and I came across your website a few weeks ago and noticed that we don't live too far away from each other. <laughs> and um, I'm a birth mom. <clears throat> and I lost my uh, oldest daughter uh, to suicide uh, about five and a half years ago. And that was my relinquished daughter that I had been reunited with from the time she was 17, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure I really have that much of a question. I have more, you know, just wanted to share um, how difficult that is as a birth mom 
to lose your child a second time mm. and uh, live with the guilt of the path I put her on. Mm. Because um, adoption was definitely part of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, she had a very, very rough life. Um, she was in a very abusive adoptive home and was uh, removed from them. And she was put into foster care. And I did, I did search for her as a minor just because my gut was telling me that there was something wrong. <clears throat> and I found her in you know, found out that she was in foster care when I, when I found her and it's a really long story, but, um, I, uh, uh, she was living in Maryland. I live out here in California. I, uh, brought her to California. Um, she was a minor. I took mm -hmm. her across state lines. You know what that means. Oh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, but we, I, I did talk to an attorney um, and, and kind of gave her the, the background. She was in a horrible uh, foster home, too. The foster home really was difficult, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, long story short, um, I eventually became her foster mom so she oh. could stay with me legally, you know. Oh. Um, and um but she did not know she was adopted. She found out she was adopted when she was 13. So that was Ooh. part of the problem. Um, um, she um, had some major losses along the way, lost um, a, a boyfriend that she was madly in love with. He was mm -hmm. killed in a car accident. Mm -hmm. um, she attempted suicide after that happened, um, was not successful. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, kind of got herself together and, um, you know, was in a really good, loving, positive relationship, just had a baby. Oh. Um, my granddaughter was 10 months old when her father uh, died in a car accident. Oh my God. Oh, and man. so, so my daughter had oh, a nice. lot of losses, you know, not only losing me, then the abuse that she suffered for many years in her adoptive home and mm -hmm losing two men that she loved. Um, <clears throat> and um, she definitely had a lot of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, and um, things just kind of got worse and worse. It's a, it's a really, really long, complicated story. I could sit here for so two sorry. hours telling you, but anyway, I just, I just, uh, you know, a lot of people know that um, adoptees are four times more likely to attempt or, you know, I feel a suicide, yeah. you know, um, and unfortunately my daughter who, you know, we were together for, mm -hmm. I don't know, 30, some 40, almost 40 years, you know, mm. um, when she died and, um, Oh, Mimi, we so are anyways, it's, you know, I, I just wanted to, be in a group where other people understand it and um and um wouldn't wish this on anyone yeah oh Mimi we are holding you and your whole your daughter and your whole family that is just so much pain and loss I am so sorry thank you for sharing your thank story you. thanks uh, for for just doing this and yeah. and letting giving people you know the space to be with other people who understand because totally. you know death losing a child is one thing but losing a child to suicide is uh suicide just adds a whole other layer to the grieving process because um yeah just because uh, it's just so <laughs> it, painful it, yeah i'm so it's, sorry it's thank really you for sharing you're welcome so and sharing. thank you for doing this yeah, yeah you're very welcome Linda. Hi, my name is Linda Clough. Um, I have a question, uh, the background a little bit. And my mother, my mother was adopted and committed suicide. Mm. Um, I found her body um, and um, uh, she was 70, almost 70 when she committed suicide. Um, my solution for that, and my question has to do with this, my solution for that 
was to drop to jump into a bottle of alcohol and stay there for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, I am an alcoholic. I've been sober for 43 years. Okay. And I, uh, yeah, it's good mm -hmm. for everybody, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. especially for me, but it's really good for everybody in my life. Um, and I tried to commit suicide when I was in high school. I don't consider myself to be uh, suicidal, uh, have chronic Societality. <laughs> That's yeah. a new word for me. <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> but my question has to do with, um, and uh, perhaps Frank is the right person to um, to answer this. Um, is uh, when I found my mother, uh, and um, and I had an interesting experience of uh, what I considered to be interesting experience. I was waiting for the. Um, for the, um, pardon? For the coroner, yes. Uh, and, um, and I meditated and I heard her as if she was in the room saying to me, where have you been? And I felt like I was two years old mm. uh, and that she was really mad at me. And I said, well, I didn't know you were gonna kill yourself. And she said, uh, I I waited for you and uh, I'm relieved, I'm released and I'm leaving. And with that, she was gone. The mm. feeling was that she mm. was there was gone. Mm. So that was interesting, particularly seeing I'm an atheist. It doesn't, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't believe in an afterlife. It was an odd thing to happen. But my question has to do with what to do with yourself when you find a person who has committed suicide and mm. a particularly a person who is so close, either a child or a parent or a yeah. spouse or something. And I, um, and I'm, uh, uh, Frank obviously has had this experience. So I'm curious about any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would find a therapist who specializes in trauma, A, and who also can do uh, suicide postvention, which is something people often ignore. Uh, somebody uh, in a school, a young person dies by suicide and, you know, they bring in counselors and so forth, but they don't really, postvention is getting everybody together who knew the person, mm -hmm. fellow employees, family, friends, and, and sort of decode. And usually everybody has a piece of the puzzle. And then the person who's doing the postvention assembles the puzzle by asking each one. And when you step back and look at the entire puzzle, it's pretty obvious that the person was rolling up to a, uh, a suicide, but nobody had all the pieces. Mm -hmm. Eight out of 10 people who die by suicide are ambivalent. Nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to the attempt. Mm -hmm. So if you know what to look and listen for, and that's what I teach, then it's possible you can stop a suicide. But yeah, most often, you know, everybody has a little piece of the puzzle. He said this, oh, he said this to me. Well, he said this, well, you know, and so when you put it all together, it looks, oh, well, gosh, a friend of mine calls that the tyranny of hindsight. <laughs> You realize in hindsight, there it was. I mean, it was, you know, plain to see, but nobody had all the pieces. So I would get some, I would work with a therapist who specializes in trauma to help work through the trauma and then and a postvention element, uh, yeah, getting questions answered. Yeah, thank you. Frank. That's, I never that's, heard of postvention. I've I, never heard that word either. Huh. I just wanted to add um, that, uh, that that was 45 years ago. So I'm, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of that, but I did want to add one thing. Uh, I am, um, I went to, I found through a person, another person who had a parent commit suicide, a wonderful Facebook, uh, closed Facebook page mm. for um, people whose parents have committed suicide. Mm. Huh. And so if you're, uh, if, if that should happen, it is a wonderful place to share those who, mm. um, who are sharing that, that experience. Do you know the name of the group? I don't, but I I can post it. I'll find it and post it in the chat. Okay. If anyone doesn't know Linda, just come back to me and I'll get it with Linda if anyone wants to find out what that is. That's very interesting. It's good to know. And the, those little pieces you were talking about, Frank, um, that people put together afterwards, this is why it's important to talk in communities and in families, right? To talk about, did you notice that our son is doing this weird thing recently and then right if we can talk about it more it, it should help i would i would say 
Um, and Marcia had a question, how do you tell someone and who do you tell? Frank answered her in the, in the text, but I thought maybe if you wanted to expound on that at all. Yeah, I tell anyone who asks, anyone who will listen. Um, I, you know, I share my story far and wide. Uh, men tend not to share things like this. Uh, they, uh, that's why eight out of 10 people who die by suicide currently are men, I think. Uh, but, you know, they neglect their physical and their mental health, not just their mental health. Um, so I, you know, I make my living telling my story. And, and I read, it, read Renee, Brene Brown's book on vulnerability. And I, about halfway through, I'm listening to it an audio book, Walk of the Dogs. Halfway through, I realized, oh, dear God. That's my superpower. I'm a guy, I'm on stage, I'm being vulnerable. And what happens is my job on stage is to give people through my story, sharing my story, uh, permission to give voice to their feelings and experiences surrounding depression, mental illness, thoughts of suicide. I do a general Q and A at the end, but before I start the general Q and A, I say, look, if you got a question you wanna ask or a story you wanna share, you wanna share with everybody. I'll, I'll hang out an extra 30, 45 minutes and take them individually. And sometimes it's two people, sometimes it's 10. And most of the conversations start this way. You know, I've never told anybody this. And I say, hmm, I get that a lot. Mm. Um, I'm on a ship. I sat down with a woman. She'd seen me the night before do stand up. It's the only seat in the entire Lido buffet that was open. So I plopped down. She looks up. She goes, you're the comedian. I go, did you enjoy the show? She goes, yeah. I said, I'm, I'm the comedian. <laughs> she laughs. She goes, what would you have said if I told you I hated it? They say, I look a lot like him. Uh, but she said, uh, is this all you do, comedy? I said, no, I'm a public speaker and I just got a TED Talk. She goes, I love TED Talks. What's the topic? Now, I'd had this conversation many times, so I thought I knew what was coming. I said, depression and suicide and started to count down in my head. Three, two, one, sure enough. She goes, Frank, I tried to kill myself twice. Yeah. We have known each other for 90 seconds. Yeah, um, yeah first time she'd done it in college, not a big deal. Second time she graduated college, graduated medical school. She said, I had the knowledge, had the equipment, I had the IV started in my ankle. Suicide cocktail, one hand, syringe in the other, getting ready to load it up. Yeah. Phone rings. Her 13-year-old son. Yeah. She goes, I don't know if he had a premonition, heard something in my voice. She said, mom, don't do it. So I didn't. I didn't give up on the idea, but I wasn't going to do it that day because I knew he would always wonder wasn't mm -hmm. there something he could do or say to stop my suicide. And, and, and there are things you can do and are things you could say. So I said to her, how old is he now? She said, he's 21. I said, does he know his phone call actually saved your life? She goes, no. How do you start that conversation? Mm -hmm. And that became the theme of my first TEDx talk and pretty much the theme of my speaking career, starting the conversation on suicide, because hardly anybody talks about it. But if you bring it up, mm -hmm. I feel like the permission fairy, yeah, Russian suicide, ding, and it out comes. And here's the thing about suicide. I've had people in their 60s tell me things they haven't told their therapist. Mm -hmm. And the reason they haven't told their therapist is if they told a therapist what they told me, uh, and they, let's say they live in California, the therapist would be bound by law to do the 50, was it 5150? Yeah. Yeah. And take them before a judge and see if they couldn't get an involuntary detention order. I think if we allowed people to give voice to their feelings and, you know, and experiences surrounding suicide without, I mean, sometimes three days lockdown is a good thing, but it keeps people from speaking up. Yeah. So. I'll tell you, I, my son, um, we are not going to go back to the ER. If that, if he gets um, a 10 out of 10, like he did the last time, I will sit with him and keep him safe until he can, uh, or get whoever I can as a resource. But taking him to the ER does not work. It has not worked for my son. Now, Take somebody to the ER if they're if you have no other options or if you know don't be afraid to take them but just know they get a three day stay at a psych hospital afterwards and at the psych hospital they won't really do anything for you they will just keep you safe like a little container but they don't treat you or give you therapy or anything they just like put you away so it's been very challenging uh, our healthcare system that's a whole another topic but. Um, yeah, I think just talking about it is the best thing. Yes, Frank? 
here's a trick for you. Um, I've had a heart attack. In addition to being, in addition to having more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd, um, we also, my mother had high cholesterol, like I'm a deep fat fryer. My dad gave me a bad heart valve. So I've had cardiac issues all my life. Had a heart attack. What I discovered when you have a heart attack and show up in the emergency room, there's no waiting. Nobody gives a shippa about HIPAA. And so my advice, if you're having a bipolar meltdown and you go to the emergency room and you want treatments, when they ask you what's wrong, I think I'm having a bipolar meltdown. And you know what? I think I'm having a heart attack because you won't have to wait. Yeah. If you say chest pain, tightness, shortness, boom, boom, you get it. Yeah. Just a tip. Break your nose. Same thing. I broke my nose. I think I'm having a heart attack. (laughs) That is very true. They run you in. Um, Judy. You have a question? Yeah, I, um, I'm part of the, the church that Beth is our music director, and um, I work with a group of youth. And the, the youth sometimes share about their feelings about suicide. And one person in particular uh, mentioned it, and I told his mother and found out, you know, he's in therapy and and all this. But what can I do as a youth group leader that I'm with the kids for about an hour on a Sunday morning? And I don't know what to do with that. Yes, Frank? I would look up Mental Health First Aid. Mm -hmm. Mental Health First Aid, I think it's .org. Mental Health First Aid.org. They have a program, uh, six hours, uh, I think six hours live, two hours online. It's a mental health 101. It's ridiculously, ri- ridiculously inexpensive. $10, $25. Mm-hmm. You type in mental health America, mental health first aid. They'll ask you where you live and then ask you how far do you want to drive for a class? You put in the number of miles and it's an, it's an eight hour live class or six hours live, two hours. And it's, it's a mental health 101. And they start with simple depression and bipolar disorder and then schizoaffective disorder and then non-lethal, non-lethal self-harm. And they give you a binder. It's an all-day class. They feed you lunch. And it's just a great way to learn the signs and symptoms, what to say and not to say, what to do and what not to do, and how to find resources. It's just a great primer or primer on mental health. So you won't be stumped for what to say, or you won't step into it and say the wrong thing, like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, turn that frown upside down. Have you tried fish oil? Uh, my favorite was, you need to choose joy. Uh, I said, unless you're talking about dishwashing liquid, I think I'm out of luck. Yeah. Uh, but people mean well. Yeah. But they just don't know what to say or what not to say. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I would say mental, mental health uh, first aid is a great, um, if you have a child, who is having these issues? NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness, N A M I, NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness. They have county chapters, pretty much every county, mm-hmm. and everything they do is free. They mm-hmm. have peer to peer counseling and family to family counseling. So you won't feel quite so alone if one of your family members is living with a, and they have a class. If you have a child that has schizoaffective disorder, they have a 12 week class once a week teaching you what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do, and how to find resources. If I have a friend that saved his marriage, saved the family. Um, they were at their wits end with a child with schizoaffective disorder and they went to NAMI, took 12 week class. Now, you know, the family's not perfect, but they're still together a dozen years later. Yeah. Thanks to they NAMI. Have, they have peer groups in Orange County. I see a lot of church people here in Orange County. They have a very active group of NAMI in Orange County. So, and uh, there's a lot of online resources too. Thank you, Judy, I, for everything you're doing for our kids and thank you for being here. And, um, this caring. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Nina has a question in chat. What is the best way to check in with your teen about suicidal thoughts? Is it best to just ask if he ever has these thoughts or feelings? Also, sometimes my teen will lash out in anger about situations or consequences and say, I would rather kill myself. How serious should we consider this type of expression? This is an adoptive mom of two children. Well, just take every threat of suicide seriously. Uh, what you're looking for is patterns. Sometimes threats of suicide are simply emotional blackmail. I have a friend whose father, my friend is now 62, his father for his entire life. Every time, every time something went wrong, he would crawl to the window and threaten to jump. That's how he got what he wanted. 
until my friend noticed his legs were inside the apartment and not outside the apartment and realized, hold on, but it's now take it seriously. Uh, to answer your question, yes, if you think your child or anyone you know is having thoughts of suicide, you ha- I would say you have to ask them, are you having thoughts of suicide? And if you can't ask that, find somebody who can. And if you can't find anybody, uh, my number is going to be in the show notes. Uh, call me and I'll ask them. Uh, there's, a, there's an old wives tale that says um, you should never mention the word suicide in front of somebody who's depressed because it might give them the idea. Yeah, like it never crossed my mind. The reverse is true. If you start a conversation about suicide, they are less likely to die by suicide. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, if they say, I'd rather kill myself, I would say, well, do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, what is the plan? And if it's detailed, time, place, and method, I would say you need to get them to a mental health facility simply for evaluation. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's a DNA cheek swab test now for psychotropics. Mm. Uh, they take your DNA and they try to match it to, let's say, the best antidepressant that works best with your metabolism. So you get a lot less. You got to get a lot less experimentation. You know, go on, doesn't work, taper off. Go on, doesn't work, taper off. It's only a couple hundred bucks. Most insurances cover it. So D, if you type in DNA cheek swab, depression meds test, it's gene site, I think. Gene site comes up first. Gene site. Yeah, a couple hundred bucks, I think. Um, and had my antidepressant not worked or worked well, if you hear this, I don't feel bad, don't feel good, don't feel anything. Time for a change of meds. Uh, uh, now, let's say they have thoughts of suicide, but they don't have an organized plan. And by the way, this is not in a book anywhere. It's not in a class I've ever taken. It's something I came up with on, on my own. I would say, well, tell me, you're going to kill yourself? And if the person said no, I would say, okay. Tell me why not make them give voice to whatever's keeping them here because something religion, parents, children, pets, whatever is keeping them here and then leverage whatever they tell you to help keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. That's really great. Uh, Linda, um, she says, uh, my mother threatened suicide my entire life from the time I was a small child. The guilt and horror of finding her body was also accompanied by a sense of relief. Finally, she finally did it. That must have been so traumatizing to have that threatened all the time when you were a kid. Oof, that is heavy stuff, Linda. I'm so sorry. Well, and you know, oftentimes people will do that. And they'll, they'll attempt in such a way that they, you know, they know the other spouse is coming home. Mm. every now and then you hear about that. Yeah, but I stopped by so-and-so for a beer. I was home an hour late and mm. yeah, but yeah, it can be emotional blackmail, but take, always take it seriously and, and look for patterns. Yeah. Yeah. So much trauma. Um, gosh. Um, I, if anyone else has questions, I am looking for hands, but I also will share while we're waiting for questions in, in that video that I shared, Joey, um, mentioned the SI scale, or I asked him about the SI scale, suicidal ideation scale. I don't know, we learned that in some sort of treatment program somewhere. So on scale one to 10, how suicidal are you right now, basically is what that is. So it's very easy for me. And if you can create some sort of language or code with your child or loved one that is kind of uh, suicidal-ish, what's your SI today? So like he said in the video, he's usually a two or three, which I wish it was zero, but I think it will just kind of always hover at two or three. He's got that deep, deep emotional wound from uh, being relinquished. And I just think he's, it'll be something he'll have to deal with the rest of his life. But, you know, when it gets five or six, I get a little like, oh, God, seven or eight. I don't leave his side. Ten. I well, I used to take him to the ER. So now I'm going to do something different. But, you know, what's your what's your SI? And we were at dinner once. A Chipotle, not even a fancy dinner, just like a regular old dinner. And he's like, mom, my SI is getting pretty high right now. I'm like, okay, what number is it? Seven. Okay. And I was able to stay calm and did something just happen? Did something trigger what's going on? Is there anything I can do? And just as we talked after he gave voice to the seven, it went down and a couple minutes later. What's your SI now? Six. Okay, good. Let's take some deep breaths. Let's I think I did a little guided meditation just right there in the Chipotle <laughs> and we were able to get it back down to three or four. So 
uh, just creating that conversation with your kids or your students or your whoever that you can talk about it. It's the not talking that's really, really um, gets people some, st some stuck. Uh, Jacques, in my home country, assisted suicide is legal. One of my relatives did that when she was elderly, 90 plus, even though she was not physically ill. Is there any point where a young person should be allowed to have that choice? Wow, that's it. Well, that's a debate that's among true. folks that I know in the mental health field. Mm. Um, the, I mean, whose life is it anyway? Yeah. Um, assisted suicide or death with dignity is legal in Oregon, but you have to have a physician and a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and you have to be within X number of weeks, months, days of, you know, uh, they think you'll be passing away. Mm -hmm. um, young people, I, you know, I, like I said, it's a, there's a great debate going on about, about that. It's your life. Why? Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's say it's your life and, and you leaving is not going to create a great deal of collateral damage. Um, that's something that people often say, suicide is selfish. Hmm. Weren't they thinking about the people they were going to leave behind? Well, guess what? One of the three legs of the three-legged stool of suicidality is something called burdensomeness, meaning you feel, I felt, the world would be better off without me. So not only was I thinking of my relatives, my friends, my family, people I was leaving behind, I thought they would be better off without me. So it's almost a selfless act, irrational, though it may be, so it's selfish looking in, it's selfless looking out. And here's something if you're at a parent that I would do at random intervals, rather than say to your child, you've got so much to live for, which by the way, I don't think I'll put a dent in it. I would say, listen, it may cross your mind every now and then that I, we would be better off without you. And in no uncertain terms, would we ever be better off without you? That's really good advice. Thank you so much. Uh, Karen, you have a question? Yeah, so I have a question, um, I guess, kind of for perspective, if you were sort of a more casual, you know, um, relation to people like a coworker, um, maybe, you know, a teacher or something like that, where um, after somebody has attempted suicide or um, come close to attempting and they're kind of transitioning back into their, you know, regular responsibilities and duties, um, you know, how should you kind of navigate that? I mean, like in some respect, I think the, you know, you feel like compelled to be like extra, extra, you know, accommodating and like, oh, you know, um, oh, it's okay. You're running late or you're, you know, you're sort of, you know, not doing this thing you said you were going to do or that sort of thing. Um, is that helpful or, um, is it better to kind of be like as normal as possible and kind of keep the same sort of expectations or boundaries, or I guess just kind of, you know, confusion over that whole situation of what's really, really best for the, you know, the person that's um, struggling. Thanks, Karen. Frank, do you have um, ideas? For I Karen? am clue free. Uh, <laughs> the, I think though with teenagers, you know, it seems to me one thing teenagers want to do since I was a teenager is fit in. And if they all of a sudden you become the suicidal kid, mm -hmm. you know, well, his mom's picking him up every day. You know, if, if they hit, if they've been riding the bus, let them ride the bus. I mean, I would, I would go back to his near normal yeah, um, and treat them as near normal, you know, not like, um, you know, a China doll as they used yeah. to say. Um, so, That's I mean, I you know, boundaries, you know, don't, you don't let them push boundaries too far. Like, you know, you promised you would cut the grass. You didn't cut the grass. I'm sorry. You got to give me the cell phone for a day or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Coming back to normalcy as much as possible and and also asking them what they need. You know, what do you need? Do you need extra space? Do you need some time off? What do you need right now? What would you like? I think maybe directly asking them um, how they want to be treated would be OK uh, if they can answer that. I don't know. I think so. Rather than dance around it because, you know, they're broken. Yeah, I noticed. Um, uh, well, you know, my son has been struggling with suicidality for years. And I think a lot of people just don't know what to say. They're like, ah, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to make them kill themselves again. You know, it's like, oh God. And it's so fraught. And I understand and being in the middle of it, I'm kind of used to it, but I just want to, the main thing, I guess the thesis of this episode is 
just talk about it. Just talk about it. Just ask. And ask the parents, how are you doing? Is there anything you need? Ask the teacher or the whoever that's around um, suicidal attempt or whatever. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, how do you know when the talk of suicide is not emotional manipulation? Oh, good question, Elizabeth. Frank, do you if know? They, if they have a plan, I would say flat out, mm -hmm. oh, you're having thoughts of suicide? Do you have a plan? And if it's detailed, time, place, and method, then I would... Again, I would get them evaluated. What is it? Is it garden variety depression? Is it a depressive state of, you know, bipolar disorder? Is medication indicated? Is the medication not working? Mm -hmm. Either, do we need to do the DNA? See, the doctor only knows what the, the drug rep told him. Yeah. Uh, your pharmacist knows a lot more about those meds than your doctor does. And the DNA test helps narrow down. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I would just ask, are you, do you have a plan? Here's something to watch out for, by the way. They've been depressed forever. And now they're happy. For no apparent reason and you're happy mm -hmm. dear god they're happy well if suicide is all about pain then they may be happy because they have in fact chosen time place and method and they know the pain is finite mm -hmm. i have a That's friend right. who the only time he was happy was when he was planning his funeral picking out the flowers and the psalms mm -hmm. and so forth um, i would also say that um, so yeah, if there's time, place, method, uh, then you take it very seriously, do all the things. And if there's emotional manipulation going on, that person is very um, troubled. So that person needs to be supported deeply with um, intensive therapy or whatever, uh, because if they're resorting to that sort of call out for help, they're, they're needing something that they're not getting somehow. Um, so it's kind of going on a treasure hunt, figuring out what tool, what person, what modality, how you can help them, how you can reach them. So that would be my advice. We're almost done. Is there any last questions or comments? Well, eight out of 10 people are ambivalent, nine out of 10 give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt, which means you can make a difference. You can save a life and you can do it by doing what we're doing right now. And that is starting a conversation if you know how. And again, I would encourage you mental health. First aid is a great way to learn how there's an adult course. And then there's a course that deals with young people. Mm -hmm. And soon they're going to have one for seniors, citizens. Nice. Yeah, that's a, there. can you go over the who, what demographics are the most likely to attempt or die by oh. suicide? Eight, eight out of 10 attempts, uh, eight out of 10 suicides these days are men, many of them um, age 45, 54, a lot of blue collar workers have lost jobs to AI. Um, there are cultural groups, uh, ethnic groups, uh, Native Americans, Alaskan Americans, um, African Americans, Latinos that have a higher rate because they generally tend not to come out to friends and family if they're struggling. That's uh, but East Asians uh, from Pakistan, from India, same thing, don't normally talk about it. Uh, LGBTQ, uh, especially the T, transgender, um, non-binary, um, uh, binary teens, 4% of them report, you know, serious thoughts of suicide, 40% of transgender teens. So 10 times as many report uh, thoughts of suicide. Women attempt three times as often as men. Men tend to complete because they use a firearm. Now, regardless of what you think about firearms, um, there are 450 million in the U.S. Every country has all the other problems we have. The one thing that separates us is that number, mm -hmm. the, the easy access to uh, lethal means of, you know, ending your life. So mm -hmm. red flag laws, I'm not sure that's the answer because I really think that's just going to light the fire. You know, take my gun away. I have a mm -hmm. deal with my neighbor across the street, Randy. I said, look, if I get the bad way, I have two guns, two handguns. I'm going to give you these handguns. You don't give them back to my psychiatrist or my psychologist calls and says, give me his guns back. Yeah. Yep, That's yep. my plan. So yep. uh, Elizabeth, I think this will need to be the last question, but it's a very good one. How do you suggest handling it when there's a strong history of depression in the family, depressed parents raising depressed teens? Therapy. Therapy for everyone. Family therapy, individual therapy, dig deep, dig deep. You guys, I know it's so hard because I'm depressed too. Well, um, and I've got a friend who's getting ready to do a TED talk. I helped her get it because I coached TEDx. And it's about treating the soul. There was a time in, in the world, in this country, when 
we treated the cause of these issues. Mm -hmm. Sometime in the early 1900s, 2028, 20, uh, we went from, a, from that model, treating the soul to a medical model, mm -hmm. where we diagnosed what we believe was the illness and then we medicated. Mm -hmm. And she believes we need to get back to, you know, medication to keep the person with us. But let's dig deep yeah. and yeah. see if we can't repair the soul, yeah. or find where the problem is yeah. and, and help repair that. I've had very good luck with EMDR. If any of you are familiar with that, EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprogramming, it's a way to kind of get into your subconscious and kind of reprogram. It's really been helpful for me. And I know a lot of people have uh, that have struggled with depression or trauma well, and psychedelics in Oregon psychedelics. Started, starting in or starting January 1st year in Oregon with a psychiatrist yeah uh, with a psychiatrist you know under the care of a psychiatrist micro dosing mm -hmm. the Canadians have been studying Canadians for years good on depression substance abuse disorder and PTSD and they believe early results it may not be a patch it may be a fix a rewiring uh -huh. so I've, I'm hopeful that that turns yeah. out to Talk to me about psychedelics if you want. Um, I did a, I did um, a psychedelic journey uh, last year, and it was transformative. So um, there's a lot of, you know, off the beaten track kind of modalities that people can look at. So there's so many tools. Just start digging. Uh, I'm going to close up. Thank you so much, Frank, for being here. Your wisdom and advice are invaluable. So thank you so much. Uh, let me drop in all of your links again, and I will send you all an email after this with uh, the recording of this and all of this, all of these links again. So don't worry. Um, there we go. Well, I'm Beth. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and I have been busted on that. A psychologist came up to me and said, "What qualifies you to speak on suicide prevention? You're not a uh, professional." Oh. And I said, because I can tell you what the barrel of my gun tastes like. Yeah. I can go to school. I can learn everything you know. You will never know everything I know. Yeah, right. You have the lived experience. Uh, and I know that you've also been certified and trained in this exact topic. So, yeah, several. Yeah. And I've had so many psychiatrists and psychologists not help us. So, whatever. <laughs> I also want to make sure you guys know about 988. In the US, anyway, sorry for the Canadians. Um, 988 instead of 911 when you're having a mental health crisis. And we've used them and they are amazing and excellent. And they will not send people with guns to your house, which is a nice bonus. And if you're um, not suicidal, just having a bad day, my phone number will be in the uh, show notes. Uh, yep. Call a crazy person. Uh, yes, call Frank. He's giving you his mobile number. I will put that in the notes as well. I just dropped in a Google Doc with a bunch of mental health resources about addiction, trauma, adoption. It's just my kind of ongoing list of things that I love. I also want to remind you about the Trevor Project. LGBTQ people are very, have a much higher incidence of suicide, and especially the T, the trans people. What did you say, Frank? Eight times? Ten times? Ten times. Ten times. The incidents. Oh, so God, we have to take care of our trans people. So sorry about that. Um, bring Frank to your company, your school, your university, your conference. He's a, a speaker all over the place. And I will send you the recording. And uh, I appreciate you so much. Please take care of yourselves today. This is heavy stuff. Some deep breaths, some meditation or whatever you need to make sure you stay grounded. I will stay on the call for a little while if anyone needs to stick around. Thank you so much for being here. And thanks again, Frank. Oh, yes. My five minutes. I rocked. You did. Awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Be well, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thank you. Hey, Mary and Ava. If, any, if either of you want to talk, I'm here. <laughs> I'm going to lie in bed, Beth. <laughs> I'm trying What's to, that? Yeah, I had to talk to you. But um, so in terms of the young man in our church, like I'm hesitant to even say to him, or oh, how are you? Ah. Would he just, he would probably lie if he's feeling suicidal ah. and just say, oh, I'm fine. It, it's uh -huh. like, I don't know how to, 
open up and I feel really bad with him because Cosmo and I were his support people to become members of the profession Jesus, of right. the church I mean uh -huh. so the coming of age Cosme was his person, yeah right? yeah yeah I took over for Cosme because he was out of the country oh, that's right I remember that yeah so you were really close to him and uh <laughs> so are you feeling um kind of guilty and responsible or um just don't mm -hmm. want to make it worse no more like I haven't even tried to reach out to him to, because of not knowing anything about from reach like even to say hi Joe. Uh, from my experience with Joey um, and Joel, because I went up to talk to him the day he came back, uh, okay. he was he was sitting in the lobby by himself. I'm like, hey, Joel, so glad you're here. I am really happy to see you. I'm really, really happy that you're okay. How are you? Is there anything you need? You know, that's what I would do. I would just okay. break the ice and just sort of act normal, you know? Okay. And, and you can, you can say, uh, I'm glad you're okay. Oh, okay. I, I think the thing is, we don't have to pretend that it didn't happen. It's not like some big white elephant in the room we can't talk about. We can, or elephant uh, in the room. It, you can talk about, but don't, you know, uh, talk about every single time you see them. <laughs> you know, just go back to having a relationship with him. He's still there. He's still the same person. He still very much appreciates what you and Cos may have done, I'm sure. And just kind of develop that relationship again. Okay. Yeah, I would encourage you. you to do that. He, and he's really sweet. He was very responsive to me when I when I talked to him um, that day, and he was very open to me. So I'm sure he would love to hear from you. Okay, good. Because I, I, I've been wanting to say to him, I, I really, he missed me being one of the minister associates or whatever you call yeah. it. Yeah. You know? I thought he was just charming. I know. He was, he was adorable doing that. And I hope he comes back to it at some point. I know. But I hope I, so, too. I think now he's, I noticed he's taking care of the, the little ones. Yeah, he's in the nursery now. Yeah. So yeah. he was having trouble there at the end of um, not showing up or not being prepared. I'm sure because of his mental health. So uh, okay. uh, thank you, Beth. Yeah, you're welcome. Glad you were here, Ava. Mary, I see your note. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, that's really, really sad. I'm so sorry to hear that. If you, if you want to, oh, Mary's gone. Okay. All right. All right. Did you, Ava, did you enjoy Frank? Yes. That was fascinating. Yeah. And I, I loved his, his response. TED talk or in his episode, I'll, I'll link all this stuff when I send everybody yeah. a note, but he was on my podcast and told the whole story of finding his aunt who had killed herself. Uh, it, it is, I don't know yeah. how that man just continues on it. What he went through was just incredibly hor horrible. Um, uh, so he's, he's really amazing. And I couldn't believe he did this for us for free. I mean, he yeah. gets like five thousand dollars to speak. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, and no, I very, very sweet. I know. I just asked him out of the blue. I've learned you just ask, and sometimes they just ignore you, but sometimes they say yes. Sure. So I think it, it, he's pretty remarkable. So very, I, I love his answer from the, to the therapist. So, you know how are you qualified when he says yeah. well <laughs> i've experienced it from i have a barrel of a gun in my mouth how exactly. about you, you? <laughs> yeah exactly that is yeah you get qualifications right there period yeah yeah exactly. they, those psychiatrists and psychologists get uh, uh territorial mm -hmm. you know, they're like don't take my patient <laughs> but god we've had so many that have just been un helpful opposite of helpful they've made things worse sometimes so uh, the little letters after their name don't mean that much to me yeah yeah 
Well, I'm so glad you came. I, I really appreciate it. I was so glad to see so many people from church because that's really <laughs> I know it's mostly church people. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted it to be I, a lot of people signed up that didn't come, which I knew because uh, they're waiting for the recording um, or whatever. But um, so there are lots of people that are not in church, too. But I'm so glad that people from church came because I could tell after that happened with Joelle, even Sean's note, she's like, something happened to Joelle. If you don't know what it is, call me and I'll tell you. I'm like, why are you not telling us? I know what it is. I knew exactly what happened. I didn't know how, but I knew there was a suicide attempt. Yeah. And it's like, why can't we say that? Why can't we say that word? We need to be able to say that word. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's a perfect example of how hesitant yeah. we are to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this. I mean, if someone topic. has cancer, you well, except there is some not admitting pe- that people have cancer. Yeah, but we used to like whisper cancer. Remember, oh, they have cancer. But right. or especially if it was like girl parts or something, they would like not tell anybody. But like, it's, I think that's changing. People are much yeah. more able to tell people about cancer, and it's sort of the same. Just like, come on, we don't have to whisper it. It's a, it's a truth. It's a very serious issue, yeah. especially in these certain demographics. Ten times for trans people, that's that's terrifying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we just need to deal with it head on. There's nothing we need to hush hush about it. Just, just talk. Well, about I was it. really glad I asked you at the end of the choir because I had been distracted by note taking mm-hmm. and I knew you allude to something. And so then you said, oh, I'll send you an email about it. I think you sent it out yeah. to everybody. Anyway, I was watching for the email. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think, oh, oh, I could go look in the Facebook page. But now she said she sent an email. I can count on that one. Great. Yes, I know that a couple of you don't read Facebook, so I made sure and sent an email. So I'm glad. Thank you. Yes. I'm glad. I think this is important. I've been doing a teeny bit more Facebook in my life, thanks to Barbara Schilling. Oh, really? Yeah. I just, is it a net positive or net negative? I've been able to. I've been able to compare that a lot of people posting like I so I went over to check my sister-in-law's postings mm-hmm. boring oh <laughs> but whereas I find what Barbara Schilling's I've found so far at least since she's hurt her <clears throat> leg mm. interesting that she she because she includes some very funny ones in too oh. she's very good at finding funny things yeah she is <laughs> funny yeah she does do funny stuff that's for sure yeah funny yeah, she's I, good. I, over the years, I've always followed you and Jan. <laughs> <laughs> You're literally like the only. Very two. good. Yeah. Well, now um, 